Hi, my name is John Borhack, and I'm Chief Solutions Architect and CEO at VMSource's Virtualization. We're a VMware partner, enterprise solution provider, and full-service virtualization practice. We'd like to take this opportunity to give you an early look at VMware vSphere 5. Let's go ahead and get started installing the vCenter server. In order to install vCenter, we're going to need to go ahead and open up the vSphere client and connect to our ESX server. We're going to use root and our standard password because we haven't set up an Active Directory domain for the ESX server yet. And you see the ESX server in our virtual machine just as we left off in our last video. We're going to right click to open a console. And then we're going to send control alt delete and log in with our local user administrator. There are a couple of important prerequisites to vCenter Server. One of those is that you enable the .NET framework. When you enable the .NET framework, if it isn't already enabled, make sure not to turn on WCF activation. WCF activation incorporates parts of IIS and will make use of ports 80 and 443 we need to reserve those ports for the vCenter install itself. The next thing we want to do is configure a static IP address for our vCenter server. We actually use a supernet in this environment. All right, after the static IP address is configured, we're going to want to join our domain. Make sure our computer name is correct. We'll specify the domain. And we're going to give it an authorized username under which to join the domain. In this case, we're going to use the domain admin account to join the domain. Okay, let's go ahead and send control alt delete. And this is fairly important. What you see in front of you is the local server administrator. This is not the account that we want to install vCenter under. vCenter should be installed under a domain user account, preferably a domain service account, but a domain administrator account will work as well. So we're going to choose switch user. We're going to choose another user. and we're going to type our domain admin credentials. Excellent. Now not only is our system joined to the domain, but we're also logged in as a domain user with the proper privilege to install vCenter. Now vCenter 5 requires a few things that vCenter 4 didn't require. vCenter 4 required forward DNS resolution. That means if you typed in ping vCenter, then it would come back with the IP address of vCenter. vCenter 5 also requires reverse resolution. That means I should be able to type nslookup and the IP address of our vCenter server and come back with the host name. 
First of all, let's make sure that our IP address is correctly applied. All right, we're 100.142, and I'm going to type NS lookup. And there we go. The name of my server at the IP address 192.168.100.142 is server2008.classroom.com. I can also type ping server2008 and get responses from my ping. Awesome. We're ready to go. Let's locate the files for our vCenter server installation. And rather than do a network install directly, I'm going to copy the folder with the VIM setup to my desktop. All right, now that we have the files locally and unzipped, I'm going to open the folder and I'm going to choose Auto Run and the VMware vSphere 5.0 splash screen for installing vCenter server looks quite a bit different than it did with vSphere 4. What we're going to do, however, is simply choose the vCenter server and select install. And now we go through the VMware vCenter server installer wizard. Of course, we agree to the terms in the license agreement. Now, I never type a license key here, even if I have one. I'd rather wait to see that the installation completes successfully and then apply my appropriate licenses from the vSphere client than type it here and have the installation fail. Just food for thought. We're going to go ahead and install a Microsoft SQL Server 2008 Express instance. Notice that the installer now uses SQL 2008 as opposed to SQL 2005, which was the default under vSphere 4. We're going to use a system account. By the way, this is the point when it attempts to resolve the host name from the IP address, in other words, an NS lookup. If you don't have reverse resolution in your environment working, you will get an error at this point. We're going to choose the install folders, create a standalone instance. Your first instance is always a standalone instance. Select ports, further ports, choose the size of our intended environment. We're not going to increase the number of ephemeral ports because we're not creating a large environment. And our install is off and running. Our VMware vCenter Server 5.0 installation is now finished. Obviously, we abbreviated somewhat. It usually takes between 10 and 20 minutes to install vCenter Server as a standalone product with an additional 5 to 10 minutes if you're installing the integrated SQL Express database. Let's go ahead and connect to our vCenter Server. This is one of the points of confusion for some people when they first start using virtualization. Right now, we're connected to our ESX server directly, which is running our vCenter server. The vCenter server itself is the management agent. So we're going to exit all VMware vSphere clients, and we're going to start a brand new vSphere client. This time, instead of logging into the ESX server, we're going to log into the vCenter server, in this case, server 2008. And the nice thing is, since vCenter is always joined to the Windows Active Directory domain, we should be able to use our Windows Session credentials to access our vCenter server without having to type a username or password. A good sign that it sees the SSL certificates installed on the vCenter server.
And here we are at our vCenter interface. Now you'll notice that over here in the inventory pane nothing has been added yet. The first item we need to create is a data center object. I'm going to name my data center demo because that's exactly what this is. Now that I've created a data center, I could either create a cluster or add a host directly. I think I'll add my host directly. We add the ESX host by host name. using the username root and the password we specified. Now while it is possible to add an ESX host to vCenter by hostname or IP address, so many of the services which vCenter server enables like HA and DRS are dependent upon hostname resolution, it's highly recommended that you add your ESX server by hostname here. There's the SHA1 thumbprint of our host. There's the inventory of the virtual machines running on our host. We're going to continue in evaluation mode. We are not going to lock the server down. And finish. Now you might ask, what's the difference as compared to logging in directly to the ESX server? Well, the big difference is that if we chose to, we could add more ESX servers to this same environment. This ESX server is already being managed by another vCenter server, so it's asking me if I'd like to continue. I'm going to say yes. There are no virtual machines running on this host. It's also in evaluation mode. And I think I'll add a third ESX host. This ESX host is also being managed by another vCenter server. And now that we have three ESX hosts being managed in one screen, the difference between logging in directly to your ESX server and managing through vCenter server should be pretty obvious. One thing of interest is you're probably going to notice the yellow triangle over our ESX server. What does that yellow triangle really mean? Well, those aren't really alarms or warnings. Those are more notifications. For example, the ESXi shell for the host has been enabled and SSH for the host has been enabled. Those are both considered security vulnerabilities and therefore they're going to create a notification which occurs on the ESX server itself. If we went to the alarms tab, there are actually no triggered alarms on any of these ESX servers. Thanks for watching. I'm John Borhek with VM Sources Virtualization. Visit us on the web at www.vmsources.com or call us at 866-644-7764. Bye.